And if I just read the verses that we started studying last time, we're going to just begin verse 11 today. Um, and not even, there's like three parts to it, and we're going to just take part one. And, uh, so, but, and then I'll give an introduction to remind us where we've been in that. Thank Jim for teaching last week. And uh, so Jude, beginning in verse 8. It's like, it says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of digni dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and ran, greedy, ran, ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. So we're talking about, as it started out in verse 4, the whole thing about Jude is a warning about certain men that have crept in, and he gives a past experience of Israel and certain men that crept in on them, and then in verse 8 he starts talking about these filthy dreamers and start talking about more in the present of what kind of people they are and uh, and then he exposes their heart in verse 11 there where not only he he told about them and really basically he's just saying they have no respect for any kind of authority uh, and then he gives a warning beginning in verse 11 woe unto them for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for, for uh, reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. We realize the book of Jude, you're learning all kinds of things about the Old Testament because he keeps referring back to certain things and there's that, those three points there in verse 11. But I did want to start, when we finished last time, we were looking at verse 10 and when it talked about those filthy dreamers, it says in verse 10 again, but these speak evil of things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things, they corrupt themselves. And so the things that he's listing about uh, defiling the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities, and uh, uh, in, in these things, the, the last thing it said in verse 10 there, in these things, they corrupt themselves. When I read that, I thought to myself, you know, it's amazing how many places in the Bible where the Bible explains that man is his worst enemy. And I got thinking of other verses, and I started running them, and I came up with a list of 15 things, and I just entitled it, What Men Do to Themselves. So you're not going to turn to these, I'm just going to share them with you, because they, they just, they, well, I'm going to share them in the order that they are. Back in Luke, chapter 7, verse 30, talked about the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of John. So when you reject the counsel of God, it's against yourself. Uh, Acts 18, uh, when the Apostle Paul went to Corinth and the Jews turned down uh, his preaching there, it says, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his remnant and said he's going to turn to the Gentiles. So uh, they opposed themselves. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 22, it talks about professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> And man, the, the, the key in all this is the word themselves, as you can see. And then in the same chapter, in verse 27, it talks about, uh, it says, And likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meet. And uh, so they just receive what's due them. Uh, because of the kind of living that they're doing and all of the living they were doing is because of them rejecting God and God giving them up and giving them over. Uh, in Romans 13 and verse 2, um, it's a, uh, it talks, that's the chapter about government which would match what we're learning here in Jude. But uh, it says, they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. And that is not so much damnation from God, but resisting the powers that are ordained by God. And a man resists the authority, the local authority, uh, they receive to themselves damnation. They, they rightfully deserve that. Um, in, verse, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, let me read that whole verse to you. It, it, oh, no, it's verse 12. But wait a minute, verse 6 talked about, uh, uh, and it is again about homosexuality, but it, it talks about, 
abusers of themselves with mankind. And it's just another way of, uh, of declaring what Romans talked about. The verse I was going to read is 2 Corinthians chapter, 12 and, uh, chapter 10 and verse 12. It says, For we, do, we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But, but they measure themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. <laughs> and that's just man patting each other on the back and making themselves look good and commending themselves. And, and those that do that, they're not wise, but a lot of themselves in that one verse. Ephesians 4.19, which is part of the section I got to preach on when I was in Chicago, talks about who being past feelings, feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. And uh, people that ha are ignorant of God's word and all, they're not only living in sin, but then they're overcome by that sin and they give themselves over to lasciviousness. In 1 Timothy 1.10, it talks about the purpose of the law and that the law is for the lost. And it says, uh, for, for them that defile themselves with mankind. And interesting, that's the third reference to homosexuality, and it's, it, man does it to himself in every one of those cases. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, where it talks about the love of money uh, is the root of all evil, while some covet after, they err from the faith, and pierce themselves through with many a sorrow. And those that have that will to be rich, they're actually piercing, they're taking a knife and piercing themselves through with many a sorrow. And so we cause our own problems. Um, uh, the snare of the devil, talking about those that are in false doctrine. It says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. When they don't rightly divide the word of truth, and that's the section there, that's, this is 2 Timothy 2.25, so just above that, 2.15, is about rightly dividing the word of truth, and then those that, that have gone into error, they've stepped in the snare of the devil, and in doing so, uh, God says that we're to use meekness, instructing those that have opposed themselves. When they step away from, when they don't believe God, they oppose themselves. It's like the very first one where the Pharisees uh, uh, reject the counsel of, of God against themselves. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3 uh, talks about the time when they're not going to endure sound doctrine, but in that process they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So they don't want to endure sound doctrine, so they bring to themselves, they, they heap to themselves teachers that'll just say the things that they want said. Second Peter in chapter 2 and verse 1 um, talked about false prophets coming in, and they shall bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And uh, as we saw that, that Peter, and this was Second Peter, uh, Peter and Jude, uh, have a lot in common. The very last time there's a warning about themselves is the verse we're looking at at the end of verse 10 in, in, uh, in Jude, where it says, uh, in those things they corrupt themselves, despising the, uh, what it started out in verse 10, uh, verse 8, uh, defiling the flesh, despising dominion, speaking evil dignities, and, uh, and in those things uh, they, they uh, corrupt themselves. So man is his worst enemy, and what he needs to do is pay attention to God's word. But there's ample warning in God's word of what man does to himself. So that ends verse 10, and then in verse 11, we got this warning about the, the certain men that crept in, these filthy dreamers that were des described in verse 8. It now exposes their heart, exposes the way they're going, what they're doing, why they're doing it. Again, verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. So they've gone the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. So we're going to be looking at all those in that middle one that uh, I want to make sure we're not even going to start the heir of Balaam because there's a lot of things we need to go back to the book of Numbers and study. But the way of Cain is certainly religious, self-righteousness, and we'll see that as we look at the way of Cain today. The heir of Balaam is disobedience to God. And then the, the gainsaying of Korah is an interest, very interesting one because it's, it has to do with rebellion against God's authority, the God-given authority. And, uh, and so anyhow, we'll express that when we get to that one. So we want to look at the first part of that, that these filthy dreamers uh, 
that oppose, that, that corrupt themselves, they have, uh, it says, uh, woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Now even before we get into the way of Cain, it starts out with that warning, that statement of woe. 106 times in the Bible, there's a warning of woe. Uh, and you don't have to turn there. I, I just want to read. This is not the first one. But uh, it's one that expresses, when you, read, when you see that word woe, that it, it is a, it's a warning of the danger that these people are in. Um, and Isaiah, I've got to find my own writing here. Chapter 3, verse 11. I'll just read you this verse. It says, Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with, it, with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. And that's just, a, you know, man corrupts himself and all of that, but the woe is, is a judgment that's going to come from God, and so there's that warning of woe. Uh, in the book of Revelation, if you come over to chapter, um, that's only the book over, so chapter 8. We'll be looking at other things later, but chapter 8. In verse 13, as you're going from the, from the first part of the trib into the second part of the trib, you've gone through the seal judgments, you've gone through four of the trumpet judgments, and now you're coming into the last three trumpet judgments. And, and it says in verse 13, it says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are, which are yet to sound. So you're moving from the middle of the trib into the last trib, and there's an announcement from heaven, woe, 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 because the last three trumpet judgments are taking you right into the final bold judgments of the wrath of God upon the earth and brings the earth to an end. So when you read woe, like in, in Jude here, woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain, that certainly, it's a, it's a warning. When it says, woe, it's not good. <laughs> there, it's a warning that there's something bad about these men who have gone in the way of Cain. Uh, now these that Jude is exposing says that they have gone in the way of Cain. And that warning of the woe is not only these, the whole idea here is there's, there's these that have crept in and they're actually trying, they crept in for the sake of drawing others in their same way. So that these that are in the way of Cain, woe to them, but anybody who follows them, uh, there's a judgment pronounced against them of all who, all who go that way are going to face God's judgment. Uh, so now, even before we go back, I think, to, uh, to Genesis where it talks about Cain, there's two places in the Hebrew epistles uh, that bring up Cain. Come to 1 John chapter 3 because you learn some things that you just carry back with us when we go back and look at that. So 1 John chapter 3. It says in verse 11, it says, For this is the message that we heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Now there's a warning you can see implied in that, that not only did Cain kill Abel, and it's because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous, and out of that jealousy he killed his brother. But then when it says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Uh, so that the warning here is what happened way back there with Cain and Abel. It's certainly what they're going to be facing in the tribulation time, where the people who do right, and they're going to need to love each other to help each other through that tribulation, but there's going to be a group of people that's going to hate them for doing what's right. And what they're going to do is they're going to have, as the book of Revelation says, the testimony of Jesus. They're going to believe that Jesus is the Christ. And those who follow the Antichrist are going to hate them and do exactly what Cain did to his brother. They're going to persecute them. They're going to, they're going to try to kill them. And uh, so that, that's the warning here. But when it says uh, in verse 12 again, it says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. So Cain was of that wicked one. He was of the devil. 
but when it, you know, some people get into some weird doctrine as if the devil and Eve actually produced Cain and not Adam and Eve producing Cain. But when, you know, they get, you know, you see the word of there, but you remember John chapter 8, verse 44, where the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the Pharisees said, ye are of your father, the devil. And he's not talking about your product of, of genetic birth from him. They're following the devil, that they're, 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 they're bragging that they're children of Abraham. And he said, if you were children of Abraham, you'd, come, you'd follow me. But he said, you're of your father, the devil. And so that, that's what this is talking about. Cain is of that wicked one. And, uh, and so be, being of that wicked one, he slew his brother because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. What you're going to see about Cain's work Cain's work being called evil is a self-righteousness that he, uh, that he offered to God his own offering, his way, as we'll look at it. And, but the point is, is there were, Cain invented his own religion. And when you see Cain actually as the one who invented religion, then you're going to realize that religion is evil. Sometimes we think, you know, it's not bad, they got a Bible, they preach about the Lord. But when you realize that if they're not teaching what God said, they're really of the, the wicked one, and their works are evil. When it's religious works for salvation, denying salvation through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's evil. It's not just off a little bit, it's not a little bit bad. According to this, it would be evil. And, uh, and, and so there, there's the warning there. Uh, even in this passage. Um, and then uh, it's part of what Timothy called the world of the ungodly. When it says there in verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Uh, that's the world of the ungodly, the lost people, and how they're going to oppose anyone who stands for the truth. So we have that. And then come over to Hebrews chapter 11. It says in verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So he became a testimony of someone who practiced verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So this is called the faith chapter, because by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Now this verse is actually promoting the good. It's actually promoting Abel. But in a sense, when he, there's the, the opposite of Abel is Cain. And so everything that's said about Abel, if we just turn it around, we, get, we can learn some things about Cain. Now, when it says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice, it wasn't that Cain offered a good sacrifice and Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. It's, a, it's the exact opposite. It was whatever the opposite of excellent is. <laughs> because we just read in, in 1 John that his works were evil. So it wasn't that he was close and Abel just did a little bit better. He actually did the opposite. He brought an evil uh, offering sacrifice unto God. So, you know, it's the opposite of Abel. And then by it, it says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. And so by his act of faith, he bore witness the fact that he was righteous. And he obtained that witness. And there, therefore, the opposite of that, Cain bore witness of the fact that he wasn't righteous. He didn't offer it in faith, and so he did it on his own, and he is, if, if Abel's righteous, Cain is unrighteous, even though he did bring a sacrifice to God, but it wasn't a sacrifice that declared him to be righteous, because it wasn't a faith. Uh, when it said there, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. There is a testimony about his gift, and there's also a testimony about Cain's gift, that it was evil, that it's not something accepted by God. 
And when it said, the very beginning in verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice, that's an important detail that we talked a lot in the book of Jude about how there's different things sometimes in the, in the epistles that add light to the Old Testament. And that is, when it said by faith, that tells you that Cain and Abel were told what sacrifice to bring. Abel, Abel didn't just think of his own and Cain thought of his own. When, when Abel brought a, a more excellent sacrifice, the sacrifice he brought, he did it by faith. He brought what God wanted. And that's how he obtained witness that he was righteous. He did it by faith. So that Cain himself knew what God requested, but he wasn't going to do it what God wanted him to do. And, and so it's by faith, implying that God told them what to bring, and they, they knew what to bring. So with that piece of information, let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. Now begin in verse 3, because we don't need to cover their birth. But in verse 3 of Genesis 4, it said, In the process of time, and that is, they're no longer children anymore, they're mature adults responsible for themselves, and so rather than their dad bringing an offering and covering the family, uh, they're responsible now for themselves. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now previously you find out that he is one who... Uh, is uh, tills the ground, and and uh, and Abel is one who uh, led the flock, and so when Cain brought that sacrifice, he brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, but he he brought the things that he worked with, the things that he grew. Sounds pretty good because that would certainly be a sacrifice, uh, but it says in verse four, and Abel he also brought of the first things of the flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So it's important to see there, they, they both bring an offering, and they're both in, in the business of, of either the flock or the, the fruit of the ground. And... Uh, but we've already learned that when Abel brought of the, of the flock and of the fat thereof, that he did it out of faith. That's what God required. But Cain brought of the fruit of the ground because Cain, what he's actually doing, he, he's do, going to do it his way. He's going to offer what he thinks would be an offering to God because he worked hard to grow this. And the statement there at, in verse 4 is that the Lord had respect unto Abel. That's the first part. He first respected Abel and to his offering. Uh, and then it says, uh, and then, but then it goes on in verse 5, but unto Cain, so it's Cain first, and to his offering he had not respect. So God first looks at the heart, and he's looking because what we just learned in Hebrews 11:6, without faith it's impossible to please God. Abel brought what pleased God because he brought it out of faith. So God had respect of Abel just because of the faith. And therefore, out of bringing what God said, the sacrifice was accepted with God. Cain, God looked at his heart and didn't see faith. He saw him offering what he thought God should have. And, and therefore, he didn't have respect to Cain. And therefore, he didn't have respect to the offering Cain brought. So, uh, as it said there... Um, that the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, and then, uh, and then, but he didn't have it unto Cain. Uh, remember, he obtained witness that his of his offering. The question is, how how did they know? It's not it's not like God came down and said, "Now, Abel, I like your sacrifice, your offering. Uh, Cain, I don't like your sacrifice." There's a way that they knew that God accepted Abel's and did not accept Cain's, and it might be a little bit of a a guess on how they knew that God had respect unto Abel's sacrifice, but the way God showed it to the nation of Israel is in Leviticus chapter 9, that after they built the uh, temple in the wilderness and then set up the priesthood and then set up the sacrifices and 
cut up all, made the sacrifice, cut up the offerings, and laid them on the altar, it says in Leviticus chapter 9 and verse 22, it says, And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them, and came down and offered uh, of the sin offering, and of the burnt offering, and peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went unto the tabernacle of the congregation, and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord, and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, uh, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. So God, they, they followed the pattern of everything God said, cut up the meat the way God said, laid it on the altar like God said. They, get, they step down from the altar, and then they wait, and fire comes down from heaven and devours that, which is God showing that this is an acceptable sacrifice to Him. So it appears that that's probably how Cain and Abel, you know, can you imagine, Cain's got his all sitting out there, and Abel's got his sitting out there, and fire comes down and devours Abel's, and Cain's still sitting there rotting and not accepted of God. So the, it was something to that effect that, that was very obvious that Cain's sacrifice or offering was rejected. It says there um, at the last part of verse 5 of Genesis 4, I like this, it says, And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. That idea of wroth is intensely angry. And then when it says his countenance fell, it, you know, did you ever see someone, you say something, and you really said something wrong, and immediately their face turns red, and maybe they're biting their lip? <laughs> because he, he's intensely angry, and he can't even hide the expression on his face. <laughs> his countenance has fallen. He couldn't contain his facial expression, because his facial expression was expressing the very mood that he was in, and uh, his demeanor so he was very angry at this. So in verse 6, it says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? <laughs> now God would have known the heart. But by that expression in verse 5, I think Abel saw it too. And, uh, so, but, but the question there in verse 6, why, why, when he said, Why art thou wroth? That, that's actually God just putting before him the very fact that he's filled with pride. Why, why are you angry? Didn't I tell you what to bring? Just go bring what I asked you to bring. Don't get mad at me. Don't, don't get mad that your offering wasn't accepted. You have no reason to be mad. And, and it's so the question that the Lord proposed here actually just points out how he was filled with pride. And, and he knew what God wanted, but he wasn't going to give God what he wanted. It's almost like Cain's attitude was, I worked hard, I brought forth this fruit, I offered it unto God, take it or leave it. It's my way or the highway. <laughs> and, uh, and, and really what he's expression, expressing is his religious works. Because it's religious because it's an offering unto God. But it's an offering of human flesh, works of the flesh. And, and he's offering that to God, and that's not acceptable. But rather than Cain, he's so filled with pride, rather than Cain saying, oh, yeah, I made a mistake, I should do it your way. He's actually saying, it's my way or no way at all. And, uh, so, but God gives him that opportunity. Verse 7 is really a chance for him to make things right. He said, if thou dost well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So when it says, if thou dost well, shalt thou not be accepted. It's like, okay, you realize that's wrong. Now I'll wait for you to go offer the right one. And, and so he had an opportunity there to repent and to do what's right. But he warns, if he does well, if he, it, it'll be accepted. And that last part of that verse, and unto, him, unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. It's almost like he will have the right, because he is the firstborn, of the, of the inheritance of the family, and Abel would be his servant. And so if he just does right, things will be accepted, and, and he can have that place of honor. But the warning is, and if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door. You're, you're opening up uh, an avenue of, of sin coming in and taking over your life. 
and, and controlling you. And, and as a result of sin in your life, there's certainly going to be that damnation, that judgment that's going to come from God. So he was given a choice, and verse 8 was his answer. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Well, that's, that's his answer. Rather, he, he, his works were evil, and rather than repenting of it and doing what God asked, sin lied at the door, and he, he just went the way of sin, killed his brother, and that's his answer that he's not going to do it God's way, and judgment is pronounced against him. So, th- there he is, a martyr. The first martyr was Abel for doing what's right, and Cain, who was of the world, of the wicked one, killing Abel, and all the way to 1 John is the warning of what's going to be like in the last days when the religion of the Antichrist takes over and people are going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they're going to do it by faith, but the world is going to hate them and and go after them. When I say go after them, let's go look at Revelation chapter 6. Now you could go a lot of places in Revelation, but I'll point this one out. Revelation chapter 6 in verse 9. This is actually just in the fifth seal judgment. So it's pretty much just the tribulation just getting started. And you'll, you can see it in the expression here. Revelation 6 verse 9 it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and, and, it was, uh, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So they're at the beginning of the trib and say, hey, you're not avenging. That last part of the trip, whoa, 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 there's where the vengeance of God begins. And, and, uh, and that's coming. And, and in that second half, there's more people going to join them in martyrdom. And, uh, and that's when God will eventually vent, uh, pour out his vengeance. Uh, in fact, when you read Revelation 20, when the resurrection sees the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Christ. So after the, after the seven years are over in the resurrection, there's going to be people that actually had their heads cut off because of their testimony of believing in Jesus as the Christ and the world of the ungodly, the world of the Antichrist is going to persecute them. And, uh, and, and so it's a warning of those days. And the warning in the book of Jude is, Woe unto them, these filthy dreamers, they have gone in the way of Cain. They're going to be persecutors. Now with that, there's something else I want to point out. Come to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, this is where the Lord is against the Pharisees. They're just like Cain. In fact, Pastor Jordan preached a message, and I didn't get it the first time. You know, sometimes he says something, you say, ah, oh, you're stretching it. Then, no, then, then you learn some things, you realize, hey, he saw something a long time ago, I'm just now catching up to. He says, who was the first Pharisee? And it's Cain. And, and this passage makes it clear, especially in light of what we just studied. In, in Matthew 23 and verse 29, it says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye, ye have built the tomb of the prophets and garnished the sepulchres of the righteous. And, and say, If it had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. These Pharisees are self-righteous. No, we would have never done that. Wherefore, ye ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them that killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye, uh, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. 
All I've got to do is read the Acts record, what the Lord said. He says at Matthew 10 they're going to do this. He says it here they're going to do that. They're not like their fathers, but they're going to do the same thing as their fathers, so they are like their fathers. He says in verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias the son of Berechiah, whom, whom ye slew, and he's saying you slew him, between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So you realize that they're just like their fathers, and their father is back there all the way to Cain. And he, and he points out, there's two, he says, uh, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias the son of Berechiah. So that what that is, is Abel is in the book of Genesis chapter 4. He was the first religious martyr. But then the, the, the Hebrew Old Testament ends with the book of Chronicles. And it's in Chronicles, I think it's chapter 22, where you have Zacharias, a prophet, stands up and was, was martyred, just as it says there, in the court, or between the temple and, and the altar. And so what he's saying is all the martyrs of the Old Testament... From, from Genesis to Second Chronicles. And that's the Old Testament. We would say from Genesis to Malachi. That all the, all the martyrs there are going to be upon this generation because this generation is going to fill up that martyrdom. Because not only are they going to crucify Christ, after his resurrection and the twelve apostles go out in the Acts period, they're going to go out and persecute them. And so he says, you're filling up what your fathers didn't finish. You're just like your fathers. And, and there's a warning there about that. So there's a warning of how that Old Testament, and if we have time, yes, go back to Second Chronicles chapter 22. Oh, it's 24. I knew I should have looked at my notes when I said that. <laughs> Second Chronicles chapter 24. Because here's where that is at. But by the way, this is, matches what I was talking about Sunday about uh, Athaliah. I said it when her husband died, but really it was when her son died that she slew all the royal seed uh, except, uh, what's his name, Josiah, Joash. And, uh, and then he was hid because he was only an infant until he was eight years old. And then the, the Jehoiada, the priest, brought him up and they slew his mother and he took the throne. And he was raised by the priest up until eight years old and, and then even guided by the priest uh, for that time. So keep that in mind. In verse 17 it says, Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made uh, uh, obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them and, lift, uh, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols uh, uh, and the wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for their trespass. And he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord and they testified against, uh, against them and they would not give ear. So, so this young Joash, he, he was... Uh, he was good all the time. Jehoiada, the priest, guided him. He was doing right. The previous chapter, they repaired the temple and did everything right. Jehoiada, the priest, the spiritual influence of his life dies. And then he's influenced by the others in Judea that they bring in idolatrous worship there. So when they brought in the idolatrous worship, it says in verse 20, And the Spirit of God came upon Zacharias, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. Now remember, he was the son of Berechiah. There's a question there, is Jehoiada, does he have a second name that's Berkiah, which is possible because a lot of, especially when you read Chronicles and Kings, they'll, they'll show up with different names, so they can have two names. Uh, but up in verse 15, you find out he died at 130 years old, Jehoiada did. So it's been also speculated that maybe that Zacharias is the grandson of Jehoiada, and a lot of times a grandson is called the son of. So if that bothers you, I just wanted to give that explanation. Anyhow, verse 20 says, And the Spirit of God came upon Zacharias the son of Jehoiada the priest, which stood above the people, and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? 
because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. So in Matthew it tells you exactly where in that court. It says, And thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness of Jehoiada his father, uh, his father had done to him, that is the father of uh, uh, Zechariah here, uh, had done unto him, but slew his son, and when he, had, when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. And so there's the, the, mart- the last martyr mentioned in the Old Testament there. So I, I pointed that out to you because of this reason. Does he look like Stephen to you? Here he's testifying the truth of God. The people don't want to hear it. So what do they do? They stone him with stones. And as he's dying, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. Now, Stephen said something different. Now, the reason I'm saying that is, remember what we just read in Matthew 23? Upon that generation is all the blood from Abel to Zacharias. It's going to be laid on him. They're coming to the end where God's judgment is going to fall upon the nation of Israel. Early Acts, they're persecuting the, the apostles, and, and then they go after uh, Stephen. And as they're killing Stephen, they're stoning him with stones. They don't want to hear it. Only Stephen says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When it was the time for God to pour his wrath upon the nation of Israel for their sin of not listening to him. And instead of God requiring it, as Zechariah said, God, rather than pouring out his wrath after the stoning of Stephen, which is what prophesied would happen, he's standing at the right hand to judge, instead opens up his grace raises up Saul of Tarsus, and the dispensation of grace begins. So there's a, you can see how this relates to Matthew 23, and then all the way to the stoning of Stephen, and it should have been required of the Lord, except that God, in the dispensation of grace, opened up a, an opportunity for all men to be saved during this age. But when this age is over, you go back to the book of Revelation, And there, we've already seen how things are going to be fulfilled. There's going to be those that are still of the way of Cain, in the way of Cain, persecuting those who are in the way of Abel, and and people dying for the testimony of Jesus Christ until Christ returns and resurrects the righteous. So, the warning of Jude, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. We'll pick up with the heir of Balaam uh, next week. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for a Bible to study and how so many things are connected and just constantly we look at one thing and look at ten other things and, and yet at the same time, Father, we realize how simple the warning is, how evil religion is when man offers their works to you instead of going to your word and by faith believe what you would have us to believe. And that is that your son has shed his blood to wash our sins away. That no religious activities of us can save ourselves, And yet men close their ears and, and refuse to come to you your way. And woe unto them because they're in the way of Cain. Father, help us to wake them up while we can. Keep giving the truth of the gospel out so some will come to their senses. Believe the truth. Receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray, amen.